meaning comes from relationships with one another. Part of the meaning comes from seeing the final product, seeing the consumer of the work itself. We have someone who come and used to work on a sandwich factory. The bread comes by and someone's laying the lettuce, someone's laying the tomato, someone's laying the bologna. Yeah, if you're the bologna person and you're there all day long, like bologna after bologna after bologna, you're gonna get fed up fairly quickly. If you have an opportunity to actually, you know, let's say put the sandwich together and sort of deliver it to the end user, if you will, you're gonna get some enjoyment. You're gonna realize you're gonna get some direct feedback because we want feedback from the work itself. It's meaningful to be able to see the product of our outcome, the consumption of the outcome, really the, the end of the value realization, if you will. Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere, where CEOs, leaders, and experts at building teams, companies, organizations, and amazing cultures share how to lead from anywhere in the world. I'm your co-host on the East Coast, Judy Bianco Mathis. And I'm your co-host on the West Coast, Mitch Simon. And we invite you to join us to Team Anywhere. Hello and welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere. I'm your host, Mitch Simon, on the west coast of California in San Diego, exactly. Today on the podcast, we have executive and entrepreneur David Henkin and management consultant Thomas Bertels from PurposeWorks. Their forthcoming book, and I have a copy. It's not out yet. By the time I guess uh, we hear this, it'll be out fixing work. So it's a tale about designing jobs, employees love, fixing work. I have an advanced copy. It says it on my copy, advanced copy. So their forthcoming book, Fixing Work, A Tale About Designing Jobs Employees Love, I just said that, helps leaders boost productivity and efficiency through human-based leadership and motivational work. I can't wait to get into this book. I haven't read it yet, but I want to hear about from you guys who wrote it. David and Thomas draw from decades of research to take readers on an investigative journey to make work more productive, satisfying, and meaningful through their allegorical tale of a typical office with typical employees. They allow us to see ourselves in the characters while learning strategies to create better jobs and perform at higher levels. So we've got David and Thomas who are on the East Coast. So David, how are you doing today? Doing great, Mitch. Uh, thanks for having us. We're really delighted to be here. Great. And Thomas, say hello. Hello. Looking forward to the conversation. All right, great. So let's do this thing. Um, let's just go into the book. You wrote a book. The book is called Fixing Work. Um, I look at the title and what I see is it's kind of cool on the top is like, the, you know, I was in drafting, I remember in seventh grade. So it's like the drafting paper and um, it has like all the tools and it looks really very design-ish and almost like architecture-ish. And just tell us, um, what's the idea behind the book, Fixing Work? Sure. Maybe just to get us started, you know, the, the basic idea behind the book is that in many organizations, work is broken. Engagement is low. Turnover is a problem. And one of the underlying causes is that, you know, so often when leaders make decisions about how work gets done, they don't design the work. They don't think about how we as humans, what we want from work, meaning, autonomy, feedback. Uh, the, the management science behind this is motivational work design. Can we think of employees as customers of the work? So many job descriptions are copies, copy pasted, and so many jobs today don't attend to those key factors. We hear about the great resignation, quiet quitting. You know, the latest Gallup survey says 60% of employees are quiet quitting. You know, leaders are pining for new approaches. Uh, this book it couldn't be more timely. It's opportune, couldn't be more timely. Great. So, uh, things that I caught which really is exciting to me. Um, motivational work design. We definitely want to go into that. Like what is motivational work? Design? There's work design. First of all, the whole, the whole idea of designing work is kind of interesting. And then motivational work design. I want to hear more about that. And then I also want to hear you said, um, looking at employees as customers, which is which one of our very first podcasts, which was like a million years ago, we talked to a futurist in Ireland and he talked about how we really need to create work as a place that is exciting, entertaining, motivational, interesting. So let's just go first maybe with this. Let's just catch you on this one, which is motivational work design. What, what is that? This goes back to the 1960s, right? So there was this wave, I think, in the 1950s, 1960s that started 
uh, where really a lot of the, what we now know as organizational development started, right? So Douglas McGregor and Frederick Kurtzberg. And there were two gentlemen, Hackman and Oldham, that basically um, started to, to pull apart, um, take, take the theory forward and say, well, kind of what makes a good job, right? And they studied it and they, and, and they developed a survey instrument. And basically their, their point is that, you know, we know that when people experience their work is meaningful, when they have autonomy and when they know how they're performing, that makes for a good job, right? And we see that every day, right? So think about, and, and there's a tool that measures this and it's been around for five, six decades. We upgraded that to fit into the 21st century, but the course is still intact. And, and, and you see that in, uh, when you look at the data over time, people who score very high on that, firemen, nurses, teachers, take teachers, right? Is the word meaningful? Absolutely, right? You're preparing kids for, you know, their life. Autonomy, right? You have a lot of degrees of freedom in the classroom, although it's shrinking over time. And knowledge of the result, feedback from the work. Yeah, a teacher, most of my parents are teachers. A teacher knows whether the kids are, you know, on track or not. So that is a well-designed job. But when it comes to office work, transactional work, knowledge work, right? What we call white collar work, we, we actually never shape the work to allow people to experience the work as motivating, right? We're taking this old Taylorist model that says, chop it into little bits and bobs. And then right, we need an army of managers to coordinate all this work. And so people lose sight of like, what's the overall outcome that, that I'm working towards, right? Uh, people can only use a small set of their skills. And the autonomy in you know, most organizations is severely limited, right? This is like the power, decision-making power is all uh, concentrated at the top. And feedback comes from the manager, not from the work itself, right? So we're basically ignoring so like the fundamental science as to like, right, what makes people show up for work and experience that work as, as, as motivating when we make decisions. And, and right, you talked about the design aspect, right? Leaders don't get trained in this, but they make every day, they make decisions, right? Oh, I got some more work to be done. Hire, you know, a junior level person to do it. We're restructuring an organization. We're moving the boxes around, right? And oftentimes by not paying attention to how that will impact the experience people have in the job, we really create the conditions for high turnover and low engagement. Maybe one little example to build on that. You know, this is your know, startups are fascinating in so many ways. And, you know, so often in a startup, you know, which maybe starts in a garage or starts in a, you know, in an office or someplace where everybody's huddled together and whether it's five people, eight people, 10 people, and everyone knows what the purpose is. You know, there isn't a cash cow to protect. Um, you get feedback generally from the work itself versus a manager because there really aren't, you know, there aren't managers floating around. Everybody's doing work. And when the firm gets large enough to then start splitting into departments, they say, okay, well, now we're so big, we'll go upstairs and you, you people now are going to sort of, you know, you're going to go down in the basement or we're going to start, start breaking things apart. Eventually you split in departments, you know, the work goes across the globe. We start replicating job descriptions, engagement drops, you know, the, the disconnectedness of the work. We tend to focus more on the process than on the human parts of the design outcomes suffer. And as Thomas said, the research on this is 50 years old. Uh, you know, th th this is where fixing, fixing work really comes, comes to bear. It's bizarre to me that we knew this. We knew this 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we knew that, well, somebody knew this. And yet um, we're in a situation where engagement scores are, you know, across the board, pretty, pretty lame. Yeah, I think what's really, I think, intriguing is to your point, right? This, this, this has been out there. Actually, in the 70s and 80s, there was a huge wave of companies that implemented these ideas. So a lot of the banks, a lot of the insurance companies, right, embraced this and got amazing results. But what happened is in the 90s, it's like re-engineering, right? And I'm not going to talk bad about Michael Hammer, right? But re-engineering came out and, and executives were like, well, okay, right? I could deal with the pesky humanoids and, and invite them to restructure the work. Why don't we just buy some technology and, and right, leap, right? And I think over the last 30 years, we've been on this technology bandwagon and Right. And, and it's a little bit like, uh, these, these scratch lotto tickets, right? We know that the odds of winning are really, really small. Right? We go back and we buy another ticket and, and think that this time it's going to be different, right? Another ERP system, another CRM system, right? And, and we really lost track of the human in the workplace. And there have been reminders, Daniel Pink wrote drive in 2008, I believe, right? That's not that long ago, right? Mastery purpose autonomy, right? I think there's, there's countless studies. I think it really boils down to, I think there's a lot of leaders 
that are really scared to, to touch like the work design because, gee, if I change the job people have and make that bigger and broader and give people more accountability, oh my, they might ask me for more money, right? And so I think organizations look at people as, as resources and we want to minimize like, the cost of the resource. And, and we fail to make the switch to think about them as customers or as investors of skills. And, and you know, some companies are doing that. They're way ahead of the time. Uh, but I think a lot of them are really still lagging behind. Before we get into um, really what makes a well-designed and intrinsically motivating job, I wanted to ask you, you wrote the book as a, you said, an allegorical tale or, or a, a, bit, a parable. Um, why did you decide to go that route, um, making it a story versus um, most business books are, here's the facts, everybody, and this is what we're telling you. It's a great question. You know, and, and th this was a deliberate decision in our part because we're, we're, we're highlighting the human in the work design. And so we thought a story format would be perfect for this topic because it provides a realistic situation for the kind of journey an executive or a manager would go on to discover and implement these ideas with characters you care about and circumstances readers can relate to in ways that make it easier to emulate, to learn from. And we've heard from some of the early readers you know, with copies like you've got, just really tremendous early feedback and endorsements uh, for, for, from folks that are eager to learn how to fix work, to take this as a playbook. Yeah, just to, just to build on what David said, um, I, I talked last week to, um, to, to somebody in my network uh, who used to be an insurance executive, right? And, and so you see, he runs a little company that, that caters to that industry. The book is set in the insurance industry. I sent him a copy and he said, oh my God, I got PTSD reading it, right? It was, it was so real, right? And, and as David said, we intentionally chose the story because also a typical business book says, well, IBM did this and now they're just counting the money. And Johnson & Johnson did this and right, everything is great. But the reality is, and, and you know that, Mitch, right? Driving change in an organization is really, really, really hard, right? There's never a linear path, right? So you got to tell the story also with the ups and downs, with the obstacles to overcome. And again, it's like, it's not easy, right, to fix work, but I think it's very rewarding. And so you wanted to paint this picture for people and really give them a sense for like what's in store for them if they go down that path. Great. So let's fix work right now. What makes a well-designed and intrinsically motivating job or a well-designed um, place where you're actually going to go to work? The first one is meaningful work, right? And People want to do something that has a purpose um, and meaningful work has really three components. One is that you know that the work you're doing is important for others, right? So that somebody ultimately relies on you. And um, the second piece is that you can use a variety of skills and competencies to get the work done, right? So people get pigeonholed, not that great. The third piece is that you do the entire job and that's really important, right? Because, right? David talked about the startups and the startups, right? There's the founder, right? That does everything from start to finish, right? As we get bigger, we break it down into little parts. People lose sight of the whole, right? So that's meaningful work, entire task, variety, and, and, and purpose. The second uh, leg of the stool is autonomy, right? People got to have some degrees of freedom about like, right? What they do, when they do it, how they do it. Um, and some people argue, well, right, autonomy is like the price of a job, right? You give up your autonomy when you join an organization. But I think we've taken it too far, right? We've really taken all the decision-making authority away from frontline people. And you see that when you have an issue with an airline or insurance company or whatever, right? You talk to people and you realize they can't give you what, what you as a customer want. The third piece is knowledge of the result, right? So it's a little bit like uh, if, if you were a bowler, and, uh, you know, you're rolling, right? You're rolling the ball down the lane. You knock a couple of pins over. You know what you got to do next. But in organizations, because we, we, we don't allow people to see what happens next, right? They're like a blindfolded bowler, right? They roll the ball down the lane. And then the manager says, you knocked five over, right? And obviously the next question is, which five, right? And so, so we, 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 we took that away from people. The last element, which is not in the original research, but that has really emerged in the last three or four decades is technology because we've thrown so much technology at people that um, it, it's on the one side, right? It oftentimes really limits people's ability, right? In so many organizations, the technology is not working well. 
So people become human middleware that need to like, you know, type data from one system into the other. But even on the more mundane level, right, the constant interruptions via email and Slack messages, right, really uh, don't allow people to do deep work, right, and really creates like this, this tension deficit disorder that we're seeing more and more. And, and so those are like the four elements um, that, that we are focusing on. And we could talk a lot more about technology, and, and maybe we will, because so much of the technology is really built around the mechanistic business process rather than, if you will, the humanistic business process. But just to build a little bit on what Thomas said, which was really great, and your question around the organization and, and what does it look like, just to add that it also takes a leader willing to see beyond the status quo, the so-called triple win. You know, it's actually possible, I can certainly tell you from direct experience, it takes people leaders willing to wanting to improve for their employees, for their customers, and for the company itself. The rewards are there, the evidence is overwhelming. Hey, we're taking a quick break to remind you to support our podcast by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a review. Your feedback means the world to us and it helps us continue to bring you more engaging and thought-provoking content for leadership and remote work. I wanted to ask you, I'm, again, this is Team Anywhere. So, uh, uh, you know, our focus is on, you know, supporting companies to be able to create um, organizations where people work from home. I, um, let's say I'm having a challenge with um, motivation of my employees. Um, I've given them, um, I've given them the autonomy to work from home. And I basically say, yeah, do your work whenever you can, uh, whatever makes sense, whatever time of the day or night. How do I, um, how do I bring in the, how do I actually use the technology well um, that has them have a job that they really love? Let me just, I'm going to just ask that first question. How do I use technology to have them have a job that they really love? It's not going to be the only element that's going to create into right, the job that they love. Right? I, I think there's a couple of things. So one is, and we've seen that actually with this work from home um, effect, right? That, that was a result of the pandemic that people said, okay, fine, right? We'll ship you the technology. All of a sudden, everybody could work from home. But what has happened is that right, work doesn't happen in isolation. Few people do the entire thing. So you got to coordinate and collaborate with others. And because the office environment disappeared, now we're relying on right, Zoom or Teams or right, whatever, whatever these tools are. And so people spend their entire day in, in these calls. And so if you think about, right, okay, well, if I could restructure the work that people can actually do the whole thing from start to finish, you probably don't need to have all these video calls because they're doing the entire job, right? So that would be one element, right? The other piece is, so like asynchronous communication, right? I think there is, um, people use, email and, and, and messaging to exchange files and support and move the work forward. And that's also not a very effective way of doing things, right? So a lot of companies just do very simple tools, like they call them Kanban boards, right? So they these little right, visual card systems that allow people to kind of like, you know, see the entire work product on, on one page. And that's something that's very popular, right, in agile software development. So again, that might be another technology change you could introduce to again, it's like allow people to, you know, get the work done without being stuck in 15,000 meetings. Okay. That'd be great. Um, meaningful. How do I, how do I create meaning when, um, let's say my employees never are in person with each other or maybe see each other once a year in person? Well, part of the meeting, meaning comes from relationships with one another. Part of the meaning comes from seeing the final product, seeing the consumer of the work itself. Um, it, it, maybe not the best analogy, but one that Thomas and I have used is, you know, we know someone who come and used to work in a sandwich factory. And you can imagine this, this is, you know, the, the, you know, the bread comes by and someone's laying the lettuce, someone's laying the tomato, someone's laying the bologna. And, you know, if you're the, yeah, if you're the bologna person and you're there all day long, like bologna after bologna after bologna, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get fed up fairly quickly. Um, but if you if you have an opportunity to actually, you know, let's say put the sandwich together and or deliver it to the end user, if you will, you're going to get some enjoyment. You're going to realize you're going to get some direct feedback because we want feedback from the work itself. It's meaningful to be able to see the product of our outcome, the, con the, the consumption of the outcome, really the, the end of the value realization, if you will. 
and you know you might get a smile and say hey this is fantastic you might get say you know too much too much mayo too much this too much what have you okay i'll, I'll fix that for next time you, you you you'd much rather take the feedback yourself and self-correct your job than have somebody come to you afterwards and say hey that was you know t t too much baloney on that and where the person might say no there's too much baloney in this all together you people all the baloney having direct visibility to the to the end product which when the work gets broken apart, when we chop the process up, we often have so little visibility to that. Yeah, maybe maybe take a non-baloney example, right? I think the non-baloney example is is there one? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I think you see it in large organizations all the time, right? If you think about like any kind of process, hiring an employee, right, processing a purchase order, right? And it's like once you start to look at how many people it actually takes, right, across how many departments. And, and how many managers are involved in coordinating the work of all these people, right? You're actually surprised that anything gets done in these organizations, right? Because it, it's just way too many people. We've broken it down to way too many small fragments, all these handovers, like things take forever. And the biggest issue there is accountability. What I hear executives tell me is kind of like, you know, when, I, right, when something goes wrong, right, everybody in the organization is like, you know, like, look here, look there, don't look here, right? And, and it's true, people can't be accountable. If you're just doing little bits and bobs and you don't have any visibility of the entire thing, how you can how can you be accountable? Right. So I think that's I think another another way to look at this. So I think if you do meaningful work, right, you can experience accountability. You can also have a sense of winning, right? You you know when you're doing a great job, right? You know when you're failing. And from from a management perspective, you know, I've been fortunate to be at larger firms and have had the domain to design, as well as startups where the necessity to design the jobs is part of part of the role, part of the fun. Whether it's hundreds of people in service organizations or you know SaaS technology firms or managed services teams, autonomy, feedback, meaning, skill development, being able to see something start to finish, and the technology to support the work, increasingly important as we see technology advance in our workplaces. We've been able to see the triple win in action in so many rewarding ways. Right. So it sounds like okay. So if I'm going to um blow up my organization today or start a new organization, I'm going to look at each, um, each employee's job. And there's, yeah, there's a test they've done, which is different depending upon what their job is. But I want to design the, the meaningfulness um, such that they can, you know, do the entire job. Um, they use a variety of skills to achieve their job, that they have autonomy, which I think a lot of that goes into, um, you know, working from home, most of us have autonomy unless you have that weird software on your computer, which checks on you every four seconds, which those, those people I don't really like to, that much. Then they have the knowledge of the result. So I actually know how I'm doing um, and that the technology is designed to facilitate um, pretty much everything above. Um, great. So then let me ask you... Um, Different people um, have different intrinsic motivations. So how do you design knowing or not knowing each person's intrinsic motivation? Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really good question. So the diagnostic that we're doing, uh, that we're running when we're helping organizations with this, um, looks at really how people experience their, their job, right? And it tells you, it's a little bit like a nutritional label on, a, on the product, right? It tells you how much autonomy they experience, how much right, feedback and so forth. So that gives you kind of like a sense. The other thing that it measures is how important growth is for you. And I think that goes a little bit to your point about like everybody's different, right? Because there are some people that just need a job to pay the bills. They're a jazz musician, right? They want to do something that they can do blindfolded, right? With their hands tied behind the bed from eight to five without wasting any kind of like creative energy because they want all that energy for when they go on stage. That's wonderful. And their jobs, right? You can't make every job meaningful and a high growth job. And a lot of people don't want this, right? So you put somebody like a jazz musician, right? Into one of these, like, this is a gross job, you know, right? Accountability, meaning, and so forth. They're going to hate it, right? That's a lot more investment than they want. But the flip side is also true, right? You hire like a bright, bushy-tailed, right? Eager person. And then you put them in a job that has no meaning, no autonomy, right? No feedback. Right, it's going to be right. You count the time in days until they leave. Right, so I think it's getting that right and maximizing right the 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 motivation for the people who want that, 
And still, I think, you know, for the jobs that, that right, we can't improve, right, hire people or find people that, that can do that work and not, not get annoyed with it. And this is where the role of the leader also is so critically important to know the difference in the recruiting process and the team development exercise in understanding how to best match individuals to roles, both from a hiring and a job assignment perspective, as well as a career development and uh, and and uh, uh, um, career planning perspective, career pathing perspective. And so much of the the basic elements of, of motivation work design are are not incorporated in these disciplines and these functions today. Can you give give us an example of um, a client that you've helped where the the design of their job wasn't motivational, and then you tweak something so that it then became motivational, and the employee went, "Oh my gosh, I now love my job." Yeah, uh, I can give you two examples. So I think one is uh, it's a very recent engagement um, with a with a media company, um, the people who place uh, digital advertising and 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 like work with brands to make that happen. Um, and, and this organization had built their own technology, um, but, but had really stopped investing, I guess, right, would, would probably be the best term for a while. And so what had happened is that, so the people at the most junior level, right, they had one system, right, where the placement came in, then they had to put that information into another system. Well, the technology was not really reliable, so they had to download it into an Excel spreadsheet and comb through lines and lines and lines to make sure all of these texts are completely fill it out and then upload that spreadsheet into the other system, right? Only to kind of like redo the same exercise again and again and again, right? And so you look at this and you say, gee, you know, that's, that's kind of crazy, right? Can we get the technology people to, to fix this, right? And, and yes, we know that there's like a long-term effort to rebuild all these systems, great. Can you do something now, right? And like you do that and all of a sudden a job, right? Where people for six hours a day were just like, you know, copying, pasting stuff in Excel, Right? That part of the job goes down to six minutes as you go back to what you actually enjoy doing, right? So that's like a job level example. Um, another example is a, is a specialty pharmacy, right? So if you're, if you're somebody who has a medical condition that requires um, like one of these very expensive drugs that needs to be infused, right? You need a nurse, you need the benefits to be verified because your insurance companies right, don't really want to pay for that. You need right, some equipment and, and right, tubing and so forth uh, to be uh, ordered. Uh, you need somebody who right, who talks to the patient and, and make sure the care is there and coordinates the nursing services to show up. That's typically all organized in different departments, right? So if you're like a, you know just freshly diagnosed as a hemophilia, call in as your prescription. Well, it might take five weeks until right that finally gets sorted out. Right? It's a very long time. People don't like to wait that long, right? After a week, they might go back to the doctor and say, "Hey, where else can I get this?" Right? So what we did there is really we took all the different disciplines and put them around the table, created a little part. So now when the description comes in, right, it's a warm handoff, right? First talk to the benefits person, then talk to the nurse, then get the technician, out it goes the door, right? Same day turnaround. So it's both, I think, a little bit like process engineering work, right? But then it's also from a work design perspective, create like a multidisciplinary team that now owns the patient experience from start to finish. Now those people can be held accountable when something goes wrong, right? And, and they accept that accountability because they got all the levers they can pull. Thomas, what I love about that is in a lot of the companies that I coach, there's, you know, there's, the, there's the throwing over the wall, that metaphor, which is, um, you know, hey, those guys uh, were supposed to handle it. We handed it over and like, where, you know, where, where was the wall, et cetera? It sounds like um, if you're designing, then you, you usually have the person which doesn't really exist in a company that's going to say, hey, you know, all these five departments, we're going to create an um, idea, a process, a design, such that all these five departments are going to work together. That person doesn't usually exist. I don't, as, is in the companies they've been working with, is it, is it an outside person or an inside person that will say, Hey, if we get these five departments to work together, understand how they're actually serving the customer, um, see the end to end and be able to um, know that the customer has actually uh, received the benefit. Um, where have you seen that type of a design happen? It, it needs some help, right? Um, it needs some facilitation. They need some help. Obviously they can, right? They can call us and we'd we'll be happy to help, but of course, David and Thomas. Yeah, it is, it's, a, it's a different way of looking at it, right? And also, it requires people that look at this across functions, right? Um, but right, the managers 
honestly in the same boat. Right. If you think about like a typical manager, right now, your job is where you're responsible for like seven, eight people. You got to schedule them. You got to check on them and so forth. Right. And, and so that's also not like a lot of fun. Right. That's not really why, why people went into, into, uh, into the job. So what we find in a lot of organizations, managers really appreciate the ability to morph into a different role, because when you move towards these more self-managing teams, then people become more coaches and advisors versus like, you know, the disciplinarian, right? And that's a much nicer, I think, leadership experience, right? And it's indirect leadership um, and uh, more like a servant leadership model, right? So again, it all depends on, right? Some leaders are going to hate this, right? Because they like the power and the control. Um, others are going to appreciate these more indirect forms of control um, and, 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 and tap into the opportunities, like, you know, give people a little bit more freedom. Right? Because at the end of the day, nobody in the world likes to be told what to do every single minute of the day. And, and just to build on that example, because it's such a great point, and I think it was mentioned early on, you, you could blow the whole thing up. One of the benefits here is you don't have to blow the whole thing up. You can start with one team. You can start with one client. You can start with, with sort of one, one layer and, and experiment and pilot and trial this in a, in a focused way. Because there's no doubt, you know, no one wants to lead with their chin. No one wants to, you know, uh, boil the ocean or, or try to do too much at one time. And the change management and the change resistance is real. You know, many firms go away from the you know, the very entrepreneurial or innovation spirit that they began with. And that status quo can be so magnetic, pulling them away from wanting to change. Uh, you know, there is this opportunity to really pilot and focus and watch some successes accumulate. Watch some of these barriers kind of get broken down and some of the the employee engagement and the customer successes begin to build and then realize that, hey, the company is actually also benefiting from this. You know, not only the workers themselves in a better spot, but the managers are spending more time facilitating career development conversations and really helping the organization and the individuals grow rather than, you know, being a control oriented person, making sure we're correcting errors and mistakes. Beautiful. Well, that's our time, gentlemen, David and Thomas. Where can we find this book, which is coming out, I guess, in, uh, in about a month, right? As we record this show. Exactly. Well, and we, we, we would direct folks to uh, fixing-work.com. Okay, great. And when we, get to, when we go to fixing-work.com, what will we find? What you'll find is um, you'll find all the endorsements for the book. You'll find a couple of sample chapters, right? So people can get a feel for the book. You can order the book. But there's also a podcast, a Work Matters podcast that really looks at different aspects of how to make work better. Um, and there's also a newsletter people can subscribe to. And there's even a link to a, a scaled down version of the diagnostic that we're using to measure how people experience their work. So people can go there and see how well designed their own job is. I love it. Yeah, I'm just checking out the, uh, the site right now. It's really exciting. It's great to have a book that reads like a story um, that we could all relate to. Um, so thanks so much for uh, creating this story for us. Um, thanks so much for taking so much time to actually take the wisdom of the 50, 50, year, of 50 years ago and make it um, usable today. And then also um, for everyone on the call to really, uh, all of our listeners to understand that um, um, it is possible to redesign work so that it is meaningful. Um, and so that you can create a, jobs in a company that people will love. So if you've loved this podcast, please make sure you share this podcast with your friends, your family, your colleagues. We'll see you next time on our next episode of Team. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more engaging content from our podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share the video with your friends so they can join the conversation too.